Welcome back, Administration of Justice 115, uh, Rules of Evidence. Um, as you can see, we're doing things a little different this week. I had to have emergency surgery, so I'm not really up and about in the classroom. So I brought you guys down to the back cave so that uh, we could do this from the office. So I apologize. Uh, you know, I like to have my whiteboard, like to be a little more interactive, but I want to make sure these videos get out. So we were talking about hearsay and uh, the exceptions to hearsay. And what you'll notice in the law, the more that you study it, is that there's a rule, and then there's an exception to the rule. And that's just kind of the way that it goes. Uh, and one of the key things that I think a lot of you identified was that that's very necessary to ensure a fair trial. It's very necessary to maintain the adversarial system. And we don't have an inquisitory system, we have an adversarial system essentially meaning that we have the prosecution and then we have the defense and they're supposedly battling it out. This of course precludes uh, deals made during the courtroom work group, but it, uh, if it actually goes to trial they are battling out using the available tools which uh, are, are the rules and the exceptions to those rules. Now they work for both sides. I saw a lot of a lot of these uh, were one way, especially when it came to uh, character witnesses. Everybody was saying, well, you can just say whatever you want. There's a couple of things with that. For one, character witness is going to be taken in kind that we realize it is somewhat of gossip, just your opinion of that person. Both sides are allowed to call character witnesses, so you can see that uh, you know they're going to say, well, this person's a great person, and the other side is going to say, no, he's a horrible person. Uh, I think that the patterns are more what we're looking for, a pattern of personality traits that emerge from those questions, and, and as with everything, we can examine and cross-examine. So. Um, we would we would certainly don't want to throw that exception away, saying, well, you know, people are just going to lie. On the other side of that, uh, people brought that up a lot that that uh, on this post, well, people are going to lie. I think it's important that we remember the idea of perjury. Whenever you're giving testimony, you're under oath, and perjury is a felony in California. It's under Penal Code 118, and uh, it can be anywhere from two to four years in prison. And so that's pretty stout, just because you want to. Uh, you know, lie on the stand. Do people lie? Absolutely. Do they get caught and, and charged with perjury? They do. So uh, that is one way to definitely reduce the likelihood of that happening. Another one that came up a lot was the dying declaration. Uh, and this kind of went both ways. Some people said, well, as the book would say, yeah, it, uh, people don't want to die with a lie on their lips, is the way the book put it. And other people said, well, I think they would lie anyways. Um, the idea behind saying that, that uh, there's no reason to think that a dying person would lie, a lot of this is wrapped up in our mystic dogma idea of uh, you know an afterlife and punishment and spirituality and whatnot. But the other side of it is very practical. See, a lie is very self-serving, and uh, there's really no benefit to a dead person to tell a lie. There really isn't. Can there be a circumstance where a dead person lied? I suppose so, but uh, there just isn't a whole lot of benefit in it for them because they're dead. So um, so that's why the dying declaration uh, has maintained as long as it has. Now, the most important thing though, that I want to bring up is that there's very strict guidelines, and uh, one of your peers brought this up repeatedly over and over and over again because of his work in law enforcement, and I, I appreciate that is that there are very strict guidelines for all of these exceptions to fall under. It's not just arbitrarily decided. They have to fit into very strict guidelines. And we get those here in California. We get those from the California Evidence Code. So while the book talks about federal, this is the California Evidence Code, and this is the most current one. And you see I have earmarked here uh, what's called Division 10. And Division 10 deals with exactly what we're talking about. So it starts with hearsay and it gives the general provisions of what is hearsay and then of course it says exceptions to hearsay now in the exceptions to hearsay as you uh, probably can't see um, but you, you can look this up all of these things are online for you um, the statement of a deceased declarant which is the, the dying declaration that's what we call in California the statement of a deceased declarant uh, there are several guidelines that, that it has to um, satisfy before it can be used. 
So again, the most important thing for us to, to understand is that these are not arbitrary decisions. They have to fit under those strict guidelines, and the, uh, the side, whichever side it is, prosecution or defense, the one bringing that up has to prove the elements of that, has to prove that it falls into those guidelines. Uh, another thing that seemed to confuse people a lot was the tacit admission. The tacit admission, or adoptive admission, uh, the book is very confusing in the way it explains it. The book says, well, you're adopting someone else's truth as your own. And uh, so we say, oh my gosh, we just believe what someone else says? That's not it. The, the book is a little bit misleading. So the adoptive admission means that I make a statement and you agree to it, and so you're then adopting my truth in your own statement. Now, where the hearsay comes in is that I can be called to the stand to report on what you said. That's technically hearsay, but the exception is that you, you made an admission by adopting my truth. So they use the example of the lawnmower in your book, so we're going to stick with that one. I'm going to elaborate a little bit on it because I don't think the book was very clear. So let's say I come home and I notice my side gate is open because I didn't lock it, but it's open and my lawnmower is gone. So I walk over to my neighbor's house and I knock on the door and I say, hey, did you steal my lawnmower? And he goes, uh, yeah, I did it. That right there, that yeah, I did it. Uh, is a, a he's uh, adopting my truth because he admitted to it so that's an adoptive admission so when I'm called into court because later when when we go to court over this because I had a very expensive lawnmower and it was grand theft because it was over you know nine hundred ninety nine dollars so now it's grand theft uh, when we go to court he's changed his story and said no I never said that I can be called to testify to what he said the adoptive admission. He, he uh, adopted my truth. So I'm saying uh, that I accepted his truth as my own by him adopting it saying, yeah, it was me. Now the tacit, that's where it gets really iffy uh, and really confusing. The tacit admission is when somebody doesn't respond and I take that as their adoption of my truth. So the same scenario, I go to my neighbor's house, knock on the door, and say, did you steal my brand new, very expensive lawnmower? And he just kind of looks down at the ground in shame. I say, well, that is a very common uh, nonverbal communication in our society that says that I'm guilty. So I can use that in court. I can, I can testify to that. I can be called to testify to that tacit admission. Uh, same thing as... If I, I saw him on the street and I said, hey, you know, my, my lawnmower went missing. Did you steal it? And he just takes off running. I can take that action as a tacit admission. Now, here's the most important part. And some people kind of picked up on this a little bit. And this is where you got confused. Tacit admission cannot be used when law enforcement is involved. And the reason for that is we have a Fifth Amendment right um, to not be a witness against ourselves. Remember, those rights aren't involved in, in, in regular civilian to civilian contact. So the Fifth Amendment doesn't come into play when I ask my neighbor, if, if just as a normal human being, no law enforcement background whatsoever, if I go to my neighbor and say, did you steal my lawnmower? He can't plead the Fifth. He can't look me in the face and say, I plead the Fifth. He, he can't do that. But as a law enforcement officer, we have the, the requirement to Mirandize if there is custody and questioning. So this idea of, of a tacit admission cannot be used as evidence where law enforcement is involved. I'm a law enforcement officer and I say, you know, I, I come up on the scene, I see the two uh, neighbors arguing over the lawnmower and I say, hey, did you steal the lawnmower? And he just puts his head down in shame. He has a right not to answer my question. He has a right under the Fifth Amendment not to answer me, not to be coerced to be a witness against himself. Therefore, I can't use that tacit admission if I'm a law enforcement officer. So that is the most important distinction, and I think that's where most people got confused on that, is because um, being a government agent, working under color of law, kind of changes the rules. So that was an important takeaway from that. So really the biggest thing here is that the hearsay rules are important, and the exceptions to the hearsay rules are important. 
it creates balance. It gives tools for us to maintain our adversarial system and create the most fair trial that we can. Is it a perfect system? And we've said this over and over again, absolutely not. But it does give us the tools to maintain the most fair that we possibly can in this day and age and, and with the current legal paradigm. Uh, and uh, uh, perjury is another really important one. Um, people were saying, well, with the hearsay, you just say whatever you want. Even if you're, if you're called as a witness, you are called under oath, which means that if you violate that, if you, if you um, willfully lie under oath for whatever reason, the reasoning is irrelevant. If you will, willfully lie under oath, according to uh, penal, California Penal Code 118, that is a felony. And so while that won't stop people from lying under oath, it certainly um, is a roadblock for it. It certainly will give pause to most reasonable people saying, yeah, I guess I better tell the truth to the best of my knowledge. When we get into things like um, when we're talking about someone's personality or their personality traits, that's largely subjective. We understand it's largely subjective. And the jury is instructed to take it as that, largely subjective. So we're really just looking for personality trait patterns over, uh, you know, a variety of character witnesses. So great job on this. Um, I have hand graded the midterm. So if you're still seeing something on the midterm you think you should have gotten credit for, then please email me. Um, when you email me, though, let me know who you are and what class you're in. I'm getting people emailing me with just their name and saying, you know, I, I didn't get credit for this. I teach several sections and some of you are in several sections, so I'm not sure what exactly you're referring to. So try to be as specific as possible to help me out so that I can help you. I want to make sure that you guys get all the credit you deserve. Um, you guys are doing an amazing job. This is a difficult class and you guys are doing a great job with it. I like to see the, the uh, discussion questions and the give and take. You guys respond to each other very well. I will say that in the past few weeks I've received a few uh, discussion posts that were one or two sentences. These should be viewed as mini essays and so if it's your only assignment for the week it's really not rigorous enough if you're just giving me one or two sentences. You're obviously not demonstrating complete concept comprehension if you're just giving me one or two sentences. So I need a little more than that. I'm not necessarily saying, I'm not going to give a word count because I'm more concerned with content. I want to see that you truly understand the concept. I don't want you just to throw fluff out there and re you know reiterate the same thing over and over again. But I don't see how you can answer any of these questions in one or two sentences. Um, so uh, let's make sure that we're really digging into the material and that we're reading it and we're synthesizing it and understanding it and, and that gives you a perfect opportunity because if you put what you believe is the answer up there, uh, one of your classmates, if it's way far off, they're, they're, they will probably challenge you on that, which is good. We want that back and forth to make sure that, that uh, we truly understand what's going on. So uh, email me, call me, drop by for office hours into the, the back cave here if you guys um, need to, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Otherwise, I will check in on you next week.